Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Carmen and I'm the Marketing Manager at AEO. I know many of you will be familiar with the AEO, but for those who aren't, we're a trade body representing a breadth of members who manage trade and consumer events. We continually work with our members in understanding shared industry needs and challenges and hope that today we can offer something beneficial to event professionals across the board. This webinar will focus on the new GDPR regulations coming into play next May and will be presented by our guest speaker, Ian Gray, who is an information and cyber security consultant. If you have any questions al along the way, please pop them in the chat box and Ian will do his best to answer as many as he can. The webinar will be recorded and made available to you in due course so you can revisit certain elements if you need to. Without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Ian. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. My name's Ian Gray of Mossif Consulting and I'll be presenting this webinar today. So let's move straight on. So I'm going to be talking about the General Data Protection Regulation which starts to be enforced on the 25th of May 2018. What we're going to look at is what you should be doing before an event, at an event, after an event, and what you should be doing now. I also need to point out that I am not a lawyer, so this is not legal advice, but I have been looking at the GDPR for about 15 months now and working out what it really means for small businesses that need to survive in this modern connected world. A little bit more about me. I've had more than 25 years experience in IT and technical areas and I've been involved in information security which covers data protection for quite a long time. Um, I'm a certified GDPR practitioner and a certified lead order, lead order server 27001. So before we just get into the slides, the thing I like to put out in my presentations, which I don't see in many other people's presentations about the GDPR, is actually how they're getting on as a company. So this is the current status of what is consulting. We've completed the data mapping exercise and most of the other things are well on their way to being completed. It's very hard, I find, to get feedback from people that are trying to give you advice without them. If they haven't actually gone through this, the advice may not be quite so good. So before an event, you've got to obviously promote it. And the first question that generally comes up is the use of existing marketing lists. Can you still use them? And I will probably say that, that you can't use them because you haven't got the right sort of consent. Now, this only applies after 25th of May 2018. And as part of the GDPR and the consent requirements, you have to have unambiguous consent to use their personal details and personal data it includes more now. It's going to be first name, last name, email address, even for a business. At the moment, the business email addresses may not be treated as personal data under the Data Protection Act, but going forward, they will do. So what can you do? Well, there's two options. One is to look at a different lawful basis for using the contact information, and that's going to be legitimate interest. And under legitimate interest, if you can prove that your right to contact somebody has a sort of higher weighting than their right to privacy, you can, can, can continue on that basis. And there are ways to do it. The Data Protection Network released a document about the legitimate interest test. I think that was two weeks ago. And there's some interesting information in there. I would recommend people just do a Google search for Data Protection Network and you will find the document. And at the end of it, there's a template where you have to do this balancing test. If you've got um, a good example here, is if some of them have gone to the same exhibition a year before and they've attended, then I personally think you could probably try the legitimate interest approach. If, they, if, if, if it's a free event and they didn't attend, you probably can't rely on that. You would have to go back to consent. So if you haven't got consent, 
what you need to do to get it. You need to put together an email that says, okay, I'll, I'm, I'm contacting you now because we've been in contact before, but to continue being sent these update emails, I need to get some more information. There's something called Article 13, which we'll come to in a minute of the GDPR, which tells you what to do. And then you can then direct them to a page where they can put those details in, and, that, and then you could use, use them going forward. The other way for promotion is social media. You don't need consent. If, if they're following you on Twitter or Facebook, even on LinkedIn, you can then use that as the platform to contact them. So it's thinking about the different routes that you can go through. So when you've got people interested, then you have the registration form. And under the GDPR, one of the principles is something called data minimization. So you shouldn't be collecting information that you won't directly be using for these purposes. And I know from personal experience, on some of the events that I go to, I have more than six pages worth of information to enter, and I'm not certain how that's going to be used. And then under the transparency part of GDPR, and one of the benefits of GDPR is that we have to be more transparent. We have to say what we're using the data for. You have to say for each of those data items why you're using it. It may just be a piece of text at the top of the first page to say that we need everything in order to register your details, or you may have to be more specific. And it's something to think about, are you actually collecting the information for a valid purpose or just because it's a nice to have? And part of the GDPR is to get away from the idea of collecting data for the nice to have, but never really using it. And I've also noted there, under the ICO Information Commission's Office, sorry, there's a document they've released called Privacy Notices, Transparency and Control. It's a PDF. If you search on their site for this, it gives them a lot of very useful information about how you put across details about why you're collecting it on form. And they've even come up with some mock-ups of pages that you could use. And I would recommend, them, recommend that to everybody to actually read that and download it. And you may need to give it to your web developer to look at it's a very useful document. So I want to go back to Article 13. What's, what is this about? So it's about the information you need to give to somebody at the point you collect the data. And I won't run through all of it, but the main points of it are the identity and contact details of the data controller, the purpose of processing, and I would guess it's probably be, you need this in order to register for the exhibition. Any recipient that you intend to pass this on to. Now, you have to tell people at the point of collecting it if you're going to pass it on to third parties. You don't have to say exactly who the third parties are, but you have to give a, a very good indication of who they are. And if you let what you can't do is then to pass them on to other third parties later on without telling the people well. You have to go back to them and tell them again if you're going to pass it on. You've also got to tell them how long you're keeping the data for. Is it a year? Is it two years? You can't keep it indefinitely. You need to make a decision, business decision, how long that data is going to be used for. And there aren't any rules on this. It's up to you as an organisation to say how long. I work with, char with charities, and in the charity arena, they have a limit of two years, and then they have to go back and ask for consent again. If they don't get it, then they've got to raise the data. Two years may be too short for you. You need to think about that or seek advice. And the only other one I want to mention about Article 13 is the right to withdraw consent at any time. Um, we're going to come back to that in a later slide. and. To withdraw consent, it's got to be as easy as it is to give it. So if you're collecting this data online, you need to have another form to say, OK, I want to withdraw my consent. The next point is about cross-promotion. It's been mentioned to me that if you're running different events within the same venue at the same time, 
you may want to cross promote them. Now, under the GDPR, I think it's going to be quite difficult to do that unless you can get somebody to consent as part of their registration process. They're also interested in this other event. But what you can do is in the emails that I, I know I receive when I go to events and exhibitions is you'll send details about how to register and, and what to do. And at that point on those emails, you may want to say, okay, well, reserve one of the, one of the slots on the right hand side of the email, so we've also got this other event going on. I think you can be quite constructive in how you do this one. But if you can get their consent up front for it, then it's even easier. And the final part on registration is security. As everybody hopefully knows, when you go into a website, it should be on something called an SSL link. And if you look at the URL at the top of the page, it would be HTTPS. And you need to make sure that you're always flexing it on one of these secure links. And there was an issue with the ABTA website back in a few months ago, March 2017, where that they weren't on the secure website and people made off with a thousand files of personal information in it. So it's going back to your web company and seeing how it works. I can see that there's some questions. I'm going to come back to those once I just do this last point. And then the other thing you should probably be giving is instructions to the people that are at the event and, and, and got stands. You may need to do one pager for them to say, you've got to be aware of GDPR and we're going to give you some more details later on. But we, we can come back to that one and you can ask questions on the next one. I'm now going to look at the questions you already asked to see if I can answer them straight away. If it's going to take too long, I'll have to do a follow-up. Um, the first one was about what if there's consent in the terms and conditions of the ticket. Well, under the GDPR, they're trying to get away from the terms and conditions being not hidden away. That's an unfair comment, but lots of small print. They want you to put all the key things at the point that you collect the information. If somebody puts a contact email on LinkedIn in their profile and they've connected with you, by all means, connect them on LinkedIn. It may, under the GDPR, there's still a question about whether you can connect with them outside of the LinkedIn platform. And we may not know that until we get some case law. What I'm talking to any people at the moment is it's probably best to keep within the platform you're connected to. Um, is HTTPS a legal requirement? No, it's not a legal requirement. It's best practice. You also find that um, some of the big website search engines like Google, if you're not on an HTTPS connection, you get pushed further down the um, search results. So it's always a good idea to do that. Generally, these are very cheap things to do. They may actually be free from your website provider. Just go back to them and ask. Another one, will the slides be available afterwards? Yes, they will be. The AEO will send you PDF versions and my contact details are at the end. So I'm now going to move on to the next slide, which is when you're at an event. So recording who goes to an event. And the ones that I go to, they're generally people on the door that scan your um, badge or, or do something else to recall that you're there. And that's fine under GDPR. That's your le legitimate interest because you're running the event, so you need to know who actually goes through the door. So I can't see there's any any problems with that. Photography and videos. Many of the events I go to, there's video cameras up on stand. There may be a video camera up actually recording you as you go in. But the rules, as I understand them, don't really change under the GDPR. There's something called the Data Protection Impact Assessment. And this currently exists under the Data Protection Act, and it's a way of looking at risks to people's personal data being infringed, and personal data in this case is their space. Um, you should probably undertake a data protection impact assessment for the events that you run. There's only really four sections to them. It's a description of what you'll be doing with the data that you collect, so if it's an image, you'll be storing it, you may need to take the store for an hour, I don't know how long you want to store it for, it may be a day or a month, an assessment of do you need, actually need to do that and any risk 
to that. And it could, the risk could be that it's stored in such a way that it's not protected. And then what measures you're taking to address the risk, which going back to the not protected one, you could just say that I'm going to store it in a secure area. And you're probably doing a lot of this already if you're having a document. And a lot of the GDPR is about process and documentation. And if you go to a DPIA, there's information on the information commission's office about this as well. It's a, it's a good way of doing things. Wi-Fi. Most events nowadays have free Wi-Fi. There is a inbuilt issue with Wi-Fi, which is it's not secure. Um, despite what people may tell you, if you get something called a, a network sniffer, which you can download off the, definitely off the Google Play Store, and I think you probably get download it off the Apple Store as well. You can actually see all the all the personal data that's going across Wi-Fi. And a way to make that more secure is to have a virtual private network. And that's another little app. And it's just like putting a tunnel onto your device. It could be your tablet, it could be your phone, and then no one will actually see this. Some virtual private networks are free. It may actually be that there's a marketing opportunity within this and sales opportunity to say to a VPN supplier, do you want to actually be part of the event and then we promote you as, as helping us. So you might be getting to get some sponsorship out of that one. And, and the other things to do, sorry, I won't say earlier on, for talking video, is just having the signs up as you go in. May have got to be visible and readable to say that the event is being videoed. We've got any more questions? Okay, I'll come back to questions in a minute. I'll just carry on with this slide. And the final one could could be thank a change for people that are at the event and have got stands about how you capture personal information. I was at one recently and somebody literally ran across the aisle and tried to do that scanner, the handheld scanner on my badge. And I was a bit surprised, and I, I didn't think that was a very a good way of doing it. And under the GDPR, that's definitely not allowed. Consent has to be freely given. So you have to have a record that somebody's actually given it to you. They have to take an action. You can't actually just scan them because they're going past. The, the people on stand have to know that they have to follow some rules. And at the moment, it, it looks like on a consent basis, you have to confirm that consent. So it may be that you check their details initially by scanning it, and then you send another email to them straight away, or within two or three days of, of the event finishing, saying, we've got your details, please apply this email to confirm that we can use them. Now, the ICO are going to give us some more details about consent. They were due to be released, I think, in July. They're now looking like August or September. There's been lots of questions asked about consent and everybody wants clarity so the ICO are going to give us some more clarity about this but I, I think um, people on stands need to be more careful about what they do and and just having a prize draw, draw bowl goldfish bowl which I see quite a lot saying put your business card here and win a prize that's fine if they win a prize that, that's brilliant but what you can't then do is then take their details and put them into your CRM system because it, it's a different purpose you haven't made it clear, you need to put, a, or they need to put a sign up to say, okay, put your card in here, you win a prize. We also want to keep your detail uh, because obviously you express an, express an interest in what we do. So you've got to make sure that they're aware of this mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. The liability is on them, not you as the event organizer, but it, it will be useful just to give them some um, ideas of what to do. And then we'll go back to the questions. To see what I can do. Um, does this relate to newsletter or email, also direct one-to-one? -one? Yes, any form of email, you need to have a lawful basis for sending it. It could be consent, it could be a legitimate interest because you've got an existing business relationship. But business relationship is actually to told them something, not in the selling process. That isn't a business relationship, that's just sort of a lead. If you have first party consent, can you send a message from the third party to this person? You would need to explore that a bit further. It may be possible. You need to look into that. All this applies globally to events or only events in the EU only. The GDPR only applies 
to people within the EU. So I think it would just be to EU events. But there is a global move towards this type of consent basis and more clarity about personal data. So I know in China they, they have a, um, a security policy now. They've just launched about consent and privacy and, and different countries that have different things. But the, the answer to that question is uh, only in the EU at the moment, but expect it to be more widely known. Will the audio be available afterwards? I think it's been recorded, so yes. What constitutes an absolute opt-in to receive information? That's a good, very good question. You can't, uh, uh, sorry, what, sorry, what you can't have is a pre tick box. You have to have a, if you've got these empty tick boxes at, at the end of your forms, that's fine. But you can't have a tick box or say a tick here to not have this. It's got to be unambiguous. So it's got to be an opt-in each time. And if you go, if you do get this ICO document, on the code of practice, it actually gives examples there, and I can help more about that as well if there's any other things. I've, I know I'm short of time, but I'm just going to continue down a few more of these questions. If that's okay. Who's liable for the exhibition scans without getting consent? If it's the exhibitor contacting them, it will be the exhibitor. That's, that's liable at all points. It's the person making the contact. Can we find examples of the type of wording using registration terms? On the ICO document I mentioned earlier, there is a very rough one, but you need to work with people to come up with something that's applicable for you. Uh, will the AEO be issuing guidance? Um, I don't know the answer to that one. Carmen? Uh, yes, we are certainly looking into it. Um, we have some legal advisors on board. Um, so as and when new regulations are released, um, we'll be trying to get that out to the industry. Okay, thank you. As we're leaving the EU, does it affect us? Yes, it does. In the Queen's speech, um, it was said explicitly that the GDPR will be taken through as part of the repeal bill. And in fact, unless something goes horribly wrong, we will still be in the EU in May 2018, so this definitely applies. And the final question at the moment is, can we send an, can we send an email to unsolicited addresses to ask permission to contact them? No, um, that's, a, that's a short answer to that one. That will be seen as, um, you'll, you'll just, it's a bit like a, a spam email for that one. You've got to, unless you can prove legitimate consent, if you've gone through the process and saying, well, these people are very likely to need our services or to attend, if you can, if, if you're certain on that legal grounds, I would say yes, but generally no. You've got to find some way to engage them through social media or another way to get them to come onto your website and register. Or you can do it by paper as well. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. So after an event, follow-up emails. It's under your legitimate interest to send somebody a follow-up email providing they've actually attended the event. If they if they booked but didn't attend, I don't think that will be a legitimate interest. That's just my view. But if you've definitely got record of attending, I would say you can send them one follow-up email. What you what that doesn't mean you can do is just to send them emails once a week for the next two or three months. In the first email you send them, you can say, really nice to have gone to the event, we would like to keep you informed, please tick this box. And then you've got their consent, you would have, you would have given out the information, and then you can continue contacting them after that. Security of personal details. This came up as a discussion panel I was on a few weeks ago where personal details at event were collected on a device, a mobile device, and that mobile device was then lost. And whoever picked the device up then had details, all the personal details that were on there. So if you are collecting them on a, on a mobile device, and that's not a bad thing to do, I think it's a really good way of doing it, make sure that mobile device is, is protected, it's got a password on it, 
if you've got if you can enable disk encryption then do that as well it's all like a basic IT function so your IT provider can hopefully do that but you've got to make sure that they're stored securely if they're on paper obviously keep them in, in one place somebody's got to look after them if it's um, if it's lost it's a data breach and a and, and the uh, for a data breach you're supposed to contact the ICO under the GDPR to let them know this has happened and what could the outcome then be. If it's just personal details, names and addresses of, uh, that you've collected on the stand, the actual impact I would think would be quite minimal, but I don't know. It, it depends what your stand does. If it's, if it's a stand about health and it's a very specific health product, that may have more of an impact because you would think that they've given the details over to find out more about this very specific health thing. So it's back to risk assessment. But the underlying issue here is just keep things secure, electronic versions and on paper. Dealing with the subject access requests. Now this is something that's already in the Data Protection Act. And the subject access request is when somebody comes to you and says, can you give me all the personal details that you hold on me? Under the Data Protection Act, you can charge a nominal fee, which is generally about £10 to process that information. Under the GDPR, you cannot charge them a fee unless it's a repeat request, in which case you can charge a fee. So what that means is you need to have a very short policy about dealing with subject access requests. Probably just a page, and then you have 20 days to respond. So if it's at an event, you have to say, okay, I, these are details affected on you at this event, send it back to them. If you don't reply within 20 days and don't fulfill this, then the ICO could take action on you. And I actually see subject access requests as a major risk to most businesses. If you get a lot of these, if you if you get a hundred of these, then it's going to take time to do it. And they'll see that isn't something that you've normally factored in. So you need to assess the risks of this. Without any case law, we don't really know what the ICO would do, whether it would just be a sort of don't do this again or is it it may even be a case that there'd be a fine. Uh, I would say the information we've got from the ICO is that they're looking for evidence of policies and procedures. So if you, if you have a subject access request procedure that seems reasonable, I, I, I think it's unlikely that you'll be hit with a fine. But if you get lots of these subject access requests coming in, it could be an issue. And the EU are going to start publicising the rights of individuals for doing things like this. So I, I'm not so quite certain when the publicity is going to start. I would guess probably March, April next year, just before the GDPR comes in. So you may start to see lots of these things turning up. Um, with the clients I work with on GDPR, it's an area that, that we are looking at about how you minimise that risk. Data retention and destruction. You need to be sure before you go in how long you're, you're going to retain the data for. And that goes back to the Article 13 requirements where you have to say how long it's going to be there. So if it's going to be two years, then you need to have a policy and a process in place for get, getting rid of it after two years, unless you have their consent to keep it for longer. So it's no longer valid to just keep storing things indefinitely. And the work I'm doing with clients is we do a data mapping exercise and we tend to find that there is a that somewhere that there is a, a list of people could be on paper sometimes and we just have to say okay, if we don't know why this is here we have to get rid of it anyway so if you've got anything on your systems and you don't know the reason for having it it's probably best to think between now and may 2018 of how you're, you're going to get rid of that just going to go down and see what questions there are um, I'm a content producer inviting a speaker from a company never contacted before. If it's somebody that it's a very specific subject and there aren't many people that would speak on this, I think you probably could reach out to them. 
on that basis, I mean, legitimate interest will be there because it's a very specific request. Does this apply to SMS and phone calls too? Can they contact you? Um, on SMS and, and phone calls, the ICO have been issuing quite large fines recently for people that are making a large amount of unsolicited phone calls. So yes, it, it does apply, and it actually applies at the moment. Uh, it, it, so you can ask how you want to be contacted. Is it by email, phone, SMS, or letter? I would say that's a, a good thing to do, and um, just having different tick boxes for that. Uh, Nan's question about registration forms. Can you say that you were keeping touch with them after the event? Um, no, you have to ask that their consent to actually keep in touch after the event. Although I did mention earlier that you could send one follow-up email, I think that's acceptable, but you can't just keep saying, I want to keep contacting you. You could look at, uh, with a lawyer at the legitimate interest route. That may be applicable. It's quite hard to say at the moment because there isn't really much guidance about legitimate interest. So it's probably best to take a relatively pessimistic view, but it's up to the risk appetite of the business if you're willing to accept that risk and something happening, then go ahead on it. But it's not completely goes against the spirit of the GDPR, you may be okay. It's something that you've got to work through. Um, do old records need to be destroyed? In storage, yes. Um, if, it, if they're very old records and, and you have no legal means or, or, or legal basis to go back to them, you, you should look at destroying them. Um, about going back to LinkedIn, at the moment, the information that we have on GDPR and discussions I've been involved in LinkedIn is keep the contacts within the platform. But this may well change when we get the consent guidance from the ICO about this. It's an area that's open to interpretation and different lawyers that I've spoken to have had different views on this. Um, if it relates directly to the sector role industry, you could argue that legitimate interest route is something to explore, but I don't think we're going to get much guidance about what legitimate interest is. We're probably going to get more guidance about what it isn't, but that doesn't really help you too much. So it may be a way of doing it. At the moment, I would say keep within the platforms. Uh, does it mean the end of third-party list purchases? Personally, I think it does. I have asked people to provide me with a third-party list with evidence of consent, specifically around the business that I do, and no one's actually come back and to me and actually given me that evidence. So. I think the third party list providers at the moment, I think it's the end of that sector as it stands, but I think there's a huge opportunity there for somebody to come up with a, a new way of collecting information and consent at the same time. And I believe there are people out there at the moment that are working on these types of applications and initiatives, but I'm not certain. At the moment, I, I wouldn't recommend buying a third party list. Data held by accounts departments, yes, that's personal data as well. So on a wider context, not just events, you've got to look at HR because you've got staff data, accounts, marketing, obviously, um, results of services such as events as well. All of that is personal data. The definition within the GDPR of personal data is anything that could identify um, a, a living individual. That is, it's paraphrasing it slightly. But it, it, it's quite wide now. So it's name, first name, last name, email address. And it's the actual combination of data as well. If, it's, if you just have first name and last name on its own, like John Smith, that doesn't really constitute the um, personal information because it's too wide. If you've got that plus a postcode, that I would say that does constitute personal information. And if you hold information on people's health, on children, you have to take more controls as well and, and ask for more consent. Best way to destroy data, if it's on paper, you can take it to somebody that does shredding, um, make sure it's one of those fine cut shredders. If it's electronic, there's various companies that are registered that will actually take away your devices and actually shred them, or they will actually physically destroy them. I know one company that, that actually makes a big show about this, it comes to your, your office, 
They take them outside and they smash it up with big hammers. But th there are different ways. I can provide more more um, background on that outside of this. If a media partner agrees to send some information about the event to their own database on their behalf, it's okay. If they've got, uh, if because if, if, at that point you're on the third part. I'm, I'm thinking this through. You're on a third party relationship. They would need to have the consent of the people they send it to. If they haven't, then it's their liability. If they say, well, we haven't asked you to send us this information, I think it's an invasion of my privacy. Um, by May 18, if we don't have permissions to use individual's data, then do we have to destroy it? You don't actually have to destroy it. Um, you need to have a retention policy in place. Let's say it's two years. And provided it's within those two years from the date you collected it, you can still keep it. But you would then need to actually go back and ask for their consent before you can then use it. That goes back to one of the original points of you can uh, you can you can send one email out that's carefully constructed to say this is what we want to do, and I, I think that should be fine. Um, if they agree to receive um, contacts after the event, that's okay. But providing what the Article 13 has been given to them, so this Article 13 can be quite key, and I think the ICO or other people will start to issue some sort of boilerplate text that we can start to use. I have got some, but it's still being refined. But if you, so the actual question is, can they, can you still make contact? So the answer is yes, if you've given them all the correct information at the time. Will it just have to give consent for us to send them invoices by email post? No, because that's a contractual arrangement. And that's another lawful basis. If you've got a contract with somebody, then that that you can send it to them on that basis. There are different ways to. I'm just going to go back to some notes I've got on a legal basis. So the, the different legal basis that you can use: there's consent, there's contractual necessity, which goes back to the invoices because you've got a contract with them to get the information. There's compliance with legal obligations if you're involved in an industry where you, you have to contact people for various legal reasons, then yes, you can use that as, as a basis to contact them. Vital interests, that's there if you're in hospital and they need to get in touch with people to find out your blood type or something else that's life-threatening, that overrides it on the GDPR. Public interest and is another one that can be used by public bodies, but it is limited. It's not um, a sort of open-ended thing for councils to keep contact with you. They, they actually have more constraints than private in private companies. And then finally, there's legitimate interest. So I'm just going to move forward in the last few minutes. So what you need to do to get ready for May 2018, I would say be part of your company-wide GDPR work. You need to ensure there's a consistent approach across the company about how you're doing this. It would be great if you're advertising a marketing event and, and you're fine, but if if there's an issue with your uh, HR department or somewhere else, then the whole company will get fined. For the email lists, I think we covered this already, go back and review them. Is there enough information to confirm they can be used in the future and have the details for the Article 13 requirements. If not, consider using legitimate interest. Go back to that document brought by the Data Protection Network, see if that was any use to you, and run that one by a lawyer. And then review capturing with personal details for events in the next few months. Is it done in a way that means you can use them in the future? There may just be a few changes you make to your sign up forms on websites. But if you do it now, then you can use it in the future. And finally, watch out for more guidelines from the Information Commissioner's Office. They are drip feeding us information. It's all very useful, but then we're sort of building up a much bigger picture of what we can do. And the next big one is going to be consent, and, and, and that's the one to look out for. But I don't know exactly when it's going to be. I think said early August, maybe September time, and that may help us. It, it, it may actually mean we have to rethink things as well. It may be more limiting than we think. Questions? I think we've covered. I'm just going to check in if there's any more. 
Um, someone says, if there's account workarounds, we source contacts from LinkedIn, but email the company, generic email address, info. Um, if you email the, just go put to info at company, that's fine. If you market for their personal attention, I think that's a bit more dubious under the GDPR. That's my view on it. But you can just email info at, and then you could say pass this to the relevant person. That would be fine because you're not putting their personal details in there. But it's a very good question. I hadn't thought about one before about using info at. Can a European company collect US data under GDPR? Um, the, the individuals are in outside of the EU. Um, I think it's almost good practice to give them more information. I'm not saying that's answering the question, but um, I think you, you, don't, you, you don't have to, if you're running events in the US, you don't need to follow these rules. But there are, said earlier on, even, um, more and more countries are coming up with these type of requirements. Generic email addresses and generic company addresses uh, exempt, yes, so if it's info at or webmaster at, they're fine. You can use those. Don't fall under GDPR because they don't identify an individual. And I do know some SMEs that do use info at their company name and they will still get general requirements coming in from people that are trying to sell them things, not just events. So I think we're now at the end of our time. So thank you. I hope that's been useful to you. Um, my contact details are on the last slide, which the AEO, I believe, will be sending out quite soon. And I will hand back to Carmen. Okay, brilliant. Thanks so much, Ian. That's fantastic. Um, while we aren't able to give clarity around all of your questions, um, I hope this session has addressed some of your concerns. Um, just a reminder that the recording will be with you very soon, and um, as I mentioned earlier, the AEO will be releasing guidance as and when we have it. Um, thanks for joining us today, and if you have any outstanding questions, um, please drop me a line um, or the generic AEO email address, info at aeo.org.uk. And if I can't answer uh, them myself, um, I'm sure Ian will be happy for me to chan channel them through to him as well. Um, so thanks once again, and thanks very much, Ian, and thanks uh, to everyone for joining us today.